Hi everybody and welcome to Smack Talk. My name as always is Rich and on this episode I'm joined by, well, the man with many nicknames, the juggernaut, the one true alpha, the Scottish suplex machine of pro wrestling, otherwise known as Joe Hendry's best mate. It's none other than the Dave Conrad. How are you doing, my man? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, no worries, buddy. It's uh, Obviously, we had the conversation with Joe a couple of weeks ago, and he's you know sung your praises a lot. I've become familiar with your work, shall we say, uh, over the last few months where I've been watching the Joe Hendry show and going back and watching your matches and you know, generally kind of getting to know you as a wrestler and as a personality, but I thought it would be important for, for other fans and fans of ours to, to get to know you as well. I oh, appreciate that, man. Absolutely. Uh, you know, that's, that's, that's why I'm doing this. Like, kind of get the reach out and let everybody kind of get a little bit, little bit more of a little bit more of an understanding of kind of who and what I am. That's absolutely cool, man. And if I can help in any way and, and we at Smack Talk can help in any way, then we'd be uh, glad to do so. Uh, so- absolutely, man. All good. So as regular listeners to the show will know, uh, I don't like to ask typical questions. Um, but that said, I do think it's vital that we talk about your background. So when did you first realize you wanted to become a professional wrestler? Man, um, it would probably have been when I was, probably when I was about, when I was a child, definitely. But, and it was always, you know, the, the typical thing like, oh, I want to be a wrestler when I grow up. Um, but it wasn't until I got to like, and again, I still felt like that even when I was like early teen years. And I thought like, mm, you know, that's just kind of there. It wasn't until I got to about kind of 15, 16 that I was like, I started getting a little bit bigger. Like I was quite a small child. Mm-hmm. And then I started to get a little bit bigger. I got a little bit taller. And I started looking and I started realizing that I had a little bit of um, like a, of an athletic, like an athleticism to me. Okay. And I was like, I, I, could, I could do this. And I started looking at like pro wrestling schools and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, and it was, that, that was kind of when I started going, like, this, this could be a thing. At the time, like, even when I first started, it was still a little bit kind of unknown again up here. Like, this scene was still in a little bit of a, of a kind of dark period where there was really not much going on. But, like, back then when I was, like, 16, there was virtually nothing. I think there was, like, two schools or something. Because uh, we're talking, you know, f- we're talking over 10 years ago. Uh I think it were yeah, and so I did that, and I figured, right, I'll just, I'll get, I'll get bigger, I'll get stronger, and it wasn't until I was like twenty that I was like, right, I'm gonna, I've had enough, I'm gonna do this, and I just decided, uh, I went to, I went to one school, uh, which was close by me, which was a bit like, uh, I don't think runs anymore. I think that that, that school's actually gone defunct, but it was a bit rough around the edges. It was a bit kind of like, mm, I'm not sure about this. Then I decided to take the leap and travel from where I'm based, Edinburgh, through to Glasgow to the Source Wrestling School. Okay. And I met with uh, who's now known as Killian Dane in WWE. At the time, he was uh, Damien O'Connor. Oh, big Dane. And he ran the Source. Yep, big Dane when he ran the Source Wrestling School, and I got started there. Uh, the training was unlike anything I'd ever experienced before in my life. Uh, again, I thought I was athletic and i thought that i had cardio and stuff until i did that and i realized like oh shit no oh, man. <laughs> this is this is different you know but yeah that's that's kind of what it was and it just was one of those things where i kind of i went to training just kind of like hey, let's see what happens and i just didn't stop going to training and here we are five years down oh, the line man. that's crazy i mean i know what you mean about like the cardio thing as well because like i am um, last year i did a training session with andy boy simmons um mm. he was wrestling at a local show and kind of said look i because i did a shirt for him and he was like come along have a go see what you think man i took one bump and i swear to god my neck for like the next three days was <laughs> just agony so like Dude, i the respect when I, I took my first bumps, when I took my first bumps i thought that i was like i'd got brain damage oh my god like it didn't it was weird for me i had like a, i had to get, it was really weird for me to get over the the idea of of bumping like mm-hmm. actually just like kind of actively taking my own bump it was very very odd to me uh, and then one day i just sort of went like like we were work we were working uh, like clothesline drills and i went like this. i'm just gonna like throw my feet up in the air and see what happens just take the biggest most over the top bump ever and i did that and then it felt fine and i was like ah like the light bulb in my head went off <laughs> it was like oh that's what you do you have to actually like have no fear of it you have to just do it 
and it felt it you know it felt a little bit stiff but i was like okay and i started then getting the the, the understanding it more yeah because i suppose it's not yeah, really box, man. well yeah it's, it's not it's like an, <laughs> it's not like a natural thing to do just fling yourself backwards onto the floor is it you know so like i mean no I think it's important for like any any non wrestlers like that listen to these because you get a lot of people on on the internet on Twitter and all that and you know it's quite widely regarded that the internet wrestling community is a bit sort of toxic at times and a lot of people that are you know those toxic entities have never taken a bump in their life so I always thought well it's really important for me as a a wrestling fan to actually experience what that's like so you know and I now have such a deep respect for anybody that steps through the ropes on a regular basis. And, and like, you know, kudos to yourself, man, because you clearly have a passion for the business and, and for sports, entertainment, wrestling, whatever you want to call it. Um, I mean, just going back through the names that you've been trained by, like, it's crazy. Obviously, you mentioned Damo. There was uh, Mikey Whiplash, Robbie Brookside, who's obviously now at the Performance Center. Dave Taylor, you know, he was tagging with yeah. William Regal. And I think, I don't know, is Dave um, working in NXT UK or am I mistaken on that one? I I know he does. I I know for a while he was uh, he was a guest coach at the Performance Center over mm, in Florida for quite a bit. Right. He would kind of travel back and forth. So like whenever he would come back to the UK, he would uh, he would usually put the feelers out to, to local schools and go, "Hey, uh, I'm coming back now. If any of you want to, you know, if we get seminars going." And that's when usually I would go, "Right, this is the time to travel down south or mm-hmm. and go down and kind of uh, work with him." I worked with him a couple a few times, and he was like. It was insane. He was kind of like, I can't describe it. He kind of had, he had a, a, re- a really good understanding of how the business had moved forward, mm. but was still able to remain true to what brought him where he is, you know, true to that, na- that real true nature of the business. Um, that kind of like, this is what looks good, you know, footwork, facial expressions, body language, but this is how you can take those old school things that matter and move them into the modern era. He did a really good job of that. Mm. Uh, another guy I trained with that really did that, and I only got the opportunity to train with him once, unfortunately, was Johnny Moss. Mm. He, he's now a full-time coach at the NXT UK Performance Center, wow. and he was another one that, again, was really understanding of footwork and, and movement and what looks good, what doesn't. Like He would always be like, right, you can do these moves, these kind of cool moves or whatnot, but... If your footwork sucks, then you need to work on that first. That headlock looks looks like it needs to be needs, needs to be tighter. So we're going to work on that. You know, little things that like true wrestling fans would notice. You know, like they always said. I think I can't remember. I think it was Brookside mentioned to us. Like he mentioned to me that he's like fans don't always understand what they're looking at. You know, they don't know why somebody might be good, but they know he's good. Like they can look at a guy like Regal. And they might look at William Regal and go, I don't know why, but he's just so fucking good. They'll look at him and go, he's so good. I can't, I don't, I can't tell you why he's good, but I just know he's good. And it's because his facial expressions, his striking, his footwork all look good. And it's that little kind of, it kind of goes back to the old school wrestling where you're kind of, you, you know, you're, you're almost putting on an illusion of sorts. Yeah, man, totally. And actually, I'm I'm kind of jumping around the timeline a little bit, but I watched um, one of your previous matches on YouTube. Uh, it was a Reckless Intent Wrestling. Uh, it was the UK title match in Cru- at Cruel Summer 2017 with DCT. Um, mm. Absolutely brilliant match. And, and it's exactly what you were saying about there. It's the little things, like watching yourself wrestle. And you've got such this a, a great mix of raw physicality but the crowd pleasing personality to go with it like you're you know getting the there's the dueling chant going at the beginning you're and you're getting your chant like higher and higher and trying to downplay the other guy and even though you're pointing at him it's like it was just such a great little thing but there was my favorite bit of that match and it sounds so strange to say it was your rising knee strikes to the gut yeah. So you'd come in tight on the on your opponent and really ram that knee in. Like it looked genuine, you know, like and it is yeah. genuine, you know, you're really going for it. It looked every bit like an MMA sort of knee strike. And mm. those that That's oh, sorry man, go on. Yeah, oh sorry, go ahead, go ahead. I was only gonna say those little touches, like your footwork, your positioning, you know, the intensity of the moveset, it's it's all there. Like it's really great. And that was such a good match to me for that for those reasons. No, I appreciate that, man. Thank you so much. Um, 
I'll tell you what, just like DCT is honestly, I've only worked him a handful of times, but he's honestly one of my favorite guys to have worked with because he, he, he gets it. He understands kind of what it is we're doing. And there it's kind of that same thing where with the way the business is going today, it's kind of, it's an awful lot of style over substance. Mm. And there's an awful lot of, you know, um, flashy glitz and glam, but a lot of the structure and the foundation is missing. I, I like to, this is why, you know, I'm a big believer in kind of going off the cuff a little bit and kind of being organic in the moment and it's stuff because of stuff like that, you know, we can plan the best, most intricate match of all time, Mm -hmm. but you don't know what the crowd are going to do when you go out there. You know, they might chant him. They might chant me. They might boo the hell out of me. You never know. They might end up chanting for weird stuff. You never know. Mm -hmm. And to, to not acknowledge them is just, it's not an insult to them, but it's almost kind of like, it removes that organic nature because all of a sudden now we've become more concerned about what we've planned backstage or what's, you know, or what's what we want to put out there more than what they've paid to come and see. If we don't allow them to feel a part of what we're doing, if we don't allow the paying audience to feel like they can influence what happens in the ring to some degree, especially when it comes to th- uh, to kids, you know, especially in like, Reckless Intent has a family audience. Mm. You know, when there's kids in the audience, you know, they, they want to feel, they want to believe that when they chant for their guy, that it matters, that it means something, you know? Absolutely. It's, it's, and being, being yeah. able to do that, it really helps. It's, it's completely true. And like across all sports, you know, if your team's losing, you want to get behind them. You want to, ri- you know, rile them up, get them to fight back. And and so the fans chanting really does matter, you know, in any in any art form or any sport. Um, what Going back to you saying about fans can chant pretty much anything. So what's the strangest thing you've ever heard chanted at you? Oh Christ! Uh, oh, there was some dodgy ones. So there's, <laughs> I remember there was there was one there was. Uh, I remember my first ever match. I remember my first ever match. This was way back. Uh, it was a singles match with Joe Coffey, mm-hmm. uh, of all people now, uh, doing pretty well for himself in NXT UK. Um, I remember I worked as a villain against him in my first ever match, which was. Uh, Certainly a, certainly a task to, to behold in my first match, you know, working with somebody of that level and, uh, you know, as a villain as well. But I remember he had uh, face paint on. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that was just kind of at the time, I don't know, I'm not sure if he's still doing it in NXT UK, but at the time he would always kind of paint one side of his face. And he, we went out in the ring and we're working a couple of holds. And because of the nature of the holds, our faces are quite close. And he ends up getting a bit of paint on my forehead. <laughs> and it kind of looks like the Harry Potter scar. No. So the fans just like within like a minute and a half of my first ever match, the fans are just like, Harry Potter. Oh my God. Harry Potter. And I was just like, what the hell are they? At the time, I didn't know, like, I'm no, I was nowhere near, you know, it's your first match. I was like, <laughs> right, what am I doing? Let's do this. You know, your, your, your thought process is so so wound up in kind of the action of everything that you for you're not able to relax as much and be able to absorb what the crowd are doing nowadays it's like really easy to be able to understand the crowd and listen Mm. for them but at the time i was like are they chatting harry potter (laughs) what the hell are they chatting that for and it never (laughs) occurred to me until i saw footage after that i had this giant big like oh no he had like red and black paint on his face like he'd had like a kind of almost like like a kind of uh like a kind of warrior war paint on his face and it like scraped down my forehead and made like the Harry Potter scar on my forehead. Oh Jesus Christ! But you, you and I was like, oh god. And you you can't script for that. You can't write for that at all, can you? Like that's just totally oh, organic no. moment. At the time, looking back on it, like if I if that happened again, like I'd spend, I'd probably have stopped midway and made a good point of like making a big like wash, rubbing it off my head and like making it seem like I'm annoyed by it, so the crowd like chant it more. <laughs> like at the time I had no idea like you know any of that stuff that was kind of let's just do this match and see how I let's make sure I don't you know m- mess up anything uh, but now like the number of things you could do with that now is insane yeah. and and obviously hindsight being 2020 like you're always gonna look back course, and go God, yeah. I wish I'd done that or you know um, I do that with every match I've ever had yeah. I can have a belter match and I'll go backstage and I'm the biggest critic of it you know I've never I don't think I've ever had anyone criticize my work more than myself. You know Anytime what? I've had anyone criticize my work, it's mm. always been less so than what I'll criticize it, or it'll be less 
like little tiny pernickety things yeah. than what I'll already have decided in my head. Like I'll get backstage and I'll have, you know, I'll have killed it out there with someone and I'll go back and I'll be like, ah, oh, I wish I'd have done this or oh, I should have done that. You know, and then I watch it back and I'm like, oh, it's not as bad as I thought. And you know what I mean? Like yeah. you always have that. I totally I'm kind of always it. trying to chase perfection. Yeah, we all are, man. Like ev- everybody right. does it. And that's so tough. <laughs> it is. And do you know what? It's kind of reassuring in a way. Like everyone I've spoken to throughout doing this and, and through music and everything, every single person is always, oh, my own worst critic, you know? Like yeah. I've, I've had a gig before where I, I play drums and I've come off stage, been fuming. And I have just, really, yeah, man. I, like, I, I finally understood what it's like to be like a musician that wanted to just trash a dressing room. I was so angry at my own performance. <laughs> like I, I was raging and bear in mind, this was with a Christian band as well. So it's like in a church. A Christian <laughs> yeah, band. yeah, man. Oh. Like, and I came <laughs> off stage and I'm like spitting thunder and this woman came over to me, bless her heart. She was like a you know, really lovely Christian lady. And she came over and she goes, oh, that was such a wonderful performance. And I dissected the entire thing to her. <laughs> <laughs> Just deer in headlights. Like, yeah. Oh. I was like, oh, it was crap. And this is uh, 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 and the bloody thing. And I dropped a stick. And F in this. And, uh, uh, uh. and she's like, oh, God. <laughs> Just walks like, away. Oh, well, well, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed <laughs> yeah. it. And you're like, well, it was terrible. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Oh, crazy! That's funny. <laughs> oh man! So we've we've all done it. Like it's it's just the yeah. funniest thing. But, but it- I think I'm able mm. to relax a lot more with wrestling now. You know, I can have with matches like I can have so much more fun and I can enjoy the process more. You know, like yeah. I'll I kind of again because I'm comfortable. Kind of at the when you first begin, you're really you get uncomfortable with kind of going on the fly and kind of doing things kind of organically in the moment. Mm-hmm. But when you get as you get more experienced and as you get sort of you get more comfortable in the ring and stuff and being able to look out onto an audience and address an audience through your action, you get more comfortable trusting your own instinct and mm. trusting your own ability. Like at the front, when I first began, like you don't trust your own ability. Yeah. You almost always think that you're going to mess up somehow. When you start to get a bit more experienced, you start to go like, Oh no, like I can, I'm fine with this. If we do this and this, I can work us to this, you know, I can get us from point A to point B, no problem. I'll work us there. And you get more comfortable trusting your own ability. And it's, it's quite a freeing feeling, you know, and that just comes from, honestly, to me, it comes from, uh, it comes from first off, just getting more comfortable, having more experience and the kind of person that I am just, you know, being able to go, well, no, I know what I'm doing. And then secondly, I have to say it's, it comes from the training that I received, you know, uh, the training I received was, I was very lucky that I received the training from, uh, Mikey Whiplash and specifically big demo before kind of all his WWE stuff started. Mm -hmm. Uh, because you know, after that, you know, obviously he, he obviously his time was a little bit more limited when he was obviously doing a lot of, uh, the stuff kind of getting scouted by WWE and stuff, but at the time he was hardcore like full-time trainer and honestly like he was one of the he's one of the best trainers i've ever come across just because he was always about no you need to be able to do this this has to be rooted in reality or why would you do that that makes no sense or if that happens just do this it'll work it'll work perfectly and he really helped me understand that you don't have to sit and create a hollywood movie script about around a match you know as long as it looks good and it's believable it can work well, yeah, absolutely, man. And it's it's like the Paul Heyman thing, isn't it? Of um, you know, who who are these two guys? Why are they fighting? And why should I care? You know, and that's as simple as booking needs to be. You know, it's just put two people together. It's it's the MMA thing, isn't it? It's the you know, you get two fighters that have no storyline with each other. They're just two fighters that are both trying to prove they're the best, and that's all you really need. And yeah. I think that's a, that's, a, that's a lost art these days, you know? It's a lost art of just being able to go, why are these two fighting? And this is this is why they're fighting. This is why you should tune in and watch it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, you man. Know? Um, I mean, just going back to your... It was your singles debut, wasn't it, against Joe Coffey? It was, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'd had a... I'd been in a battle royal before that. Uh, yeah, which that was, was... Was that Battle Zone, like, wasn't it? Yeah, and that's kind of a... Like, SWA's version of, like, a 30-man battle royal. Also, kind of Royal Rumble, um, over the top rope kind. Of? Yeah, kind of like a Royal Rumble sort of deal. Uh, most companies, uh, most companies have them, uh, and that was kind of they were. They they said to me that it was like, hey, do you want to do you want to debut in the battle zone? And I was like, hell yeah! And so <laughs> I did that, and it was 
it was, I can't remember how long I was in. I couldn't have been very long. But I remember, uh, I can still remember it pretty vividly, though. I remember I came in and you just, you know, you're a house of fire. You're kind of attacking everybody. And then I remember just you get thrown out. You go backstage and you're like, wow, that was, that was awesome. And it's kind of like that, that kind of adrenaline feeling. I remember that. Christ, that was long ago, man. That'll be, that'll be six years in October. Yeah, it was, um, I've, I've been doing my research, my due diligence. It was October the 12th, 2013. Yeah, yeah. wow. And you, you came That's... in at number 16. <laughs> number 16. Yeah. And, and Next middle number, not bad. Right, it's a good spot. And do you know what? The, the names that are in that match with you, like some of the names, it's crazy. Like you, you forget when you see people on TV that they've been sort of in the indies plying their trade for a long, long time. I mean, just yeah. some of the names. Obviously, there's uh, Joe and Mark Coffey. Um, yep. Jack Gallagher, who obviously went Jack into Gallagher, big, yep. big things. Rampage Brown. Yep. You know, and, and, of course, the prestigious one himself, Joe Hendry, was in that match too. Joe Hendry made his debut that same night. Yeah, we both debuted on the same night. Yeah, of course. I completely forgot that it was his debut. It, that's the bit of research that I didn't do and now look like a tool. But... Uh, <laughs> But it's not about him. It's not about him. Even though my next question is, given that you're best friends, was that how you first met? Uh, we we first met through pro wrestling, yeah. And it wasn't it wasn't actually on that show. Okay. We we first met in training actually. Uh, like literally, I think two three months after I started training. Okay. So I started training in the October of 2012, mm-hmm. and I was training for a few months. And I think Joe began training in January of 2013. Ah, so right, literally, so. he started training just shortly after I did. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing was, I wasn't as... I didn't take to the business as quickly as Joe did physically. Mm. Joe had a, a judo black belt at the time. I think he'd, uh, he got his judo black belt. and he So he knew already how to kind of roll, how to take kind of bumps and things, a little kind of how to fall properly, so to speak, and how to kind of move and kind of the, the footwork of things. So he took to the business like a duck to water. Like, you know, it sounds... It sounds kind of easy to say that, but he really did. Because I remember uh, I came, so I, I travel through from Edinburgh every week. And so would Joe. Mm-hmm. And I remember Damo talking to me and saying, hey, there's another guy from uh, Edinburgh just started up. Um, so you, you don't know if you guys want to maybe travel together or something like that or, or get chatting and see if it kind of, you know, see what happens. And I was like, oh, it's sound, man. I'll, I'll see him. I'll see what happens. And so I think it was in the, it was, I think it was the February. And I, I showed up in the February to train and you know there's a different guy there and it, it was joe and i remember we go in and we're just working kind of we, we do a drill where basically uh, and this is honestly one of the best drills i think you can ever do especially as a trainee uh is you everyone lines up along along the apron and you just tag in and out and you just work holds okay. you just work holds and then when you're done working some holds you tag in somebody else they come in they take over and you just keep rolling 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 and just uh you know uh working holds and I remember I get in there with Joe and he's just like I wasn't sure what to make of him because I was kind of like and I was just starting to kind of find my footing with holds Mm. uh you know uh, I didn't know that many at the time uh and I was kind of like you know always encouraged to just kind of use my size in matches Uh, but I was working holds with Joe and he's just throwing out arm drags and like head mares and all these kind of cool moves and I was like Jesus Christ this guy's good (laughs) I was like, I was like, this guy's only been training a month. I was like, he's really good for a month. Like, and then I found out later, like, yeah, he's got the judo black belt and like, you know, and then learning, speaking to him. So one of the things that I looked for was people, uh, that, that took the business the same way I took it, which was seriously, mm-hmm. you know, very seriously. Cause you get, you know, and this is not a knock on anybody, you know, this is, this is, I am honestly, Anybody that comes into pro wrestling to train, that even if they just, they just want to train, they just want to get in shape, you know, they just want to try something new. I'm absolutely up for that. I think that it's an amazing thing to try. I think it's great, especially if you're a fan, to get better, a better understanding of it. But the people that I drew, I was gravitated towards before the very beginning when I first started were the people that kind of were like, oh, no, I want to be a heavyweight champion. Or in Joe's case, I want to be WWE champ. Mm-hmm. And it was like, immediately I was like, I, I resonated with that. And I related to that immediately. I was like, yes like that's why i'm here i want to be a champion i want to be i want to do really well with this that's why i'd go to the gym and i'd get in shape and you know stuff like that and and 
that night, like we traveled back on the train to Edinburgh and we just were chatting away and we realized like we're both really into wrestling. We're both into the similar style of wrestling. Uh, we were into like video games and stuff like that. Like, it was the same sort of deal, you know? We were just very, very, we were very much into a lot of the same stuff. And then every week it was like we would just travel back and just keep chatting on the train and stuff. And that was it. Like, and we just ended up becoming really, really good friends. And that's kind of how it started. And then we ended up just happening to debut on the same. So I think we we debuted in the battle zone and then our singles debuts were also on the same night. I believe Joe worked Jackie Polo the same night I worked Joe Cuff. That's amazing. It's it's so strange how life works out sometimes as well, like with that serendipitous yeah. kind of meeting. Because obviously, you know, through that chance thing, you know, you both happen to be training at the same place. And um, am I right in thinking that Joe was the one that made you transition towards amateur wrestling or was that um, something you were doing Actually, prior? Actually, it's the other way around. Oh, Okay. So I'd actually, so at the time, obviously with independent wrestling, you know, you're not making a fortune of money at the beginning. Mm-hmm. You're, uh, so obviously I was working another job and one of the jobs I worked was a bouncer. I actually worked as a, a, a bouncer, uh, door security. And uh, one of the things I realized was, oh, I actually, like, I, I, you know, I was always kind of the, the headstrong sort of like, oh, if, if, if some, some kid wants to start stuff, like they'll batter them, eh? But I didn't actually know how to batter anybody. <laughs> I didn't actually know, like, you know what I mean? Like, you think you know. You're like, oh, I'll just, you know, I was big and I was strong, you know, and I wasn't afraid of anybody. Mm-hmm. But I was like, you know, I thought to myself, like, if I came up against someone who actually knew how to fight, I'd get my ass whipped. <laughs> so I decided I wanted to go and learn some amateur wrestling. Sure. I was like, I want to learn some amateur wrestling so I can learn how to take people down safely and control them on the ground in case a fight kicks off. So I don't have to necessarily punch them in the face and potentially like, you know, do real damage to them. You know, mm-hmm. you don't want to do that to drunk people. You know, they're, they're drunk. They're just being stupid. All you want to do is stop them from hurting you or someone else. Yeah. So I was doing a wee bit of amateur wrestling stuff and I happened to put the, the mention out to Joe and I says, Hey man, you should uh, give this a try. And I'd said, I was like, it's at Napier university in edinburgh you know like they do the edinburgh wrestling club like uh shout out to the edinburgh wrestling club by the way one of one of the best wrestling clubs in the entire country uh that i've been to like uh unbelievably good place um unbelievably good coaches as well uh really taught me pretty much most if not everything i know about uh, freestyle wrestling now but uh so and then he went up there and i'd uh i'd had a bit of an injury so i wasn't i wasn't training for a little couple of weeks and Joe had been up there for, uh, this is a funny story. Again, I don't know if he, if he uh, touched on this, but one of the funniest stories was Joe went up to training and on the first night they were like, you know, because obviously he had his judo black belt, so he was quite familiar with grappling already. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he already kind of knew. Now Joe did judo, I believe Joe uh, got his black belt when the double leg, the, the double leg takedown was still uh, a, 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 a technique within judo. Okay. So he already knew how to sort of shoot double legs and things like that. So he was already quite uh, familiar with a lot of the a lot of the sort of things that would be effective in wrestling. And as far as I'm aware, I don't know if this is again. This is. I think I've, I've, I'm not sure if I'm getting the story completely correct. You know, you might have to liaise with Joe and see, and he might work <laughs> out some of the finer details. But the story goes that he turns up. And the first night he sparred. Uh, so you do like sparring at the end. So you'll do like technique. You warm up. You'll do technique practice. You know, and then you'll do like some sparring at the end. So like kind of live goes, you know, where you're not quite going like competition 100%, but you're trying to beat the guy, you know, you're yeah. just on the mat wrestling, basically trying to win and score points. The, the, the rumor was that Joe got on because he was bigger than everybody. Uh, they put him on with their basically like their competitive, uh, like heaviest guy, like their heavier guy who was about kind of like 95 to 100 kilos in weight. Okay. And Joe pieced him up pretty much immediately. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much immediately uh joe sort of pieced them up and uh they were like oh god that's our uh that's our competitive heavyweight right there um do do, do you want do you want to compete <laughs> and within, within i believe i think it was two or i think it was three training sessions and already uh, within three training sessions i believe he had gone to he then went to the the scottish championships wow that's insane so he took again, much like pro wrestling, he took to amateur like a duck takes to water. Like he was, and he got managed to get silver. Like, and you can find that you can find the match on YouTube. You know, he was he against the guy that took gold. He was absolutely destroying him. Joe was up. All he had to do, no, Joe, he jokes about it. He didn't understand the rules at the time. <laughs> 
he didn't understand the rules and he ended up uh, he ended up be, uh, almost beating the guy he so in, in amateur wrestling in freestyle wrestling you have a, a few ways to win you can either you've got six minute match mm-hmm. uh, which is comprised of two three minute periods okay. with a 30 second sort of break in between uh he what you do so you can you can if you could last out the six minutes it's whoever has the most points at the end can win uh, if you pin the guy if you pin the guy uh before the end of the six minutes or if you can get 10 points ahead of him and they'll take it as what's called a technical fall okay. or technical superiority so you basically it's like all right you're you're battering this guy too much like Just this is you know kind of like the um, mercy rule in baseball sort of thing Basically like a mercy rule. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. exactly like that. Okay. So Joe is eight up. Joe's eight points up. And again, he doesn't understand the rules that well. But So he's eight points up and he takes a shot in on the guy. He didn't realize he only had to score two more points to win. Oh, no. but he takes a shot in on the guy and the guy sort of gets a sort of a half-hearted pin. Mm. And it looks kind of like Joe has his shoulder up on the footage. Mm. and But the, the ref kind of pin, kind of counted as a pin anyway. Oh man! And it was like, mm, and it's kind of you know amateur wrestling referees are you know they can be a wee bit dodgy, <laughs> but you know that when we we kind of theorized that like at the time Joe was sort of filming a pro wrestling documentary thing, uh, oh, okay, and you know he kind of came in as the pro wrestler and you know that's unfortunately in the amateur circles it's not great they're not a big fan of kind of the, pro wrestlers coming in yeah. because to them to them Joe Joe was just this at this pro wrestler coming in. And just fanning about. They didn't realize that he actually was a skilled grappler. They didn't yeah. realize he was actually, you know, a judo black belt and actually understood grappling to a high level. You know, that's no getting a judo black belt, especially at that time, was no joke. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so within three, two, I think it was three training sessions, Joe basically almost became a uh, Scottish national champion <laughs> within three training sessions. That's ridiculous. So yeah, he, I, I was into amateur wrestling first. But he okay. took to it a lot quicker than I did. Oh, that's got to make you sick, isn't it? <laughs> nah, man. Joe, I'll tell you what, man. He, in terms of my amateur wrestling stuff, Joe has done an absolute shit pile for making me a better wrestler. Mm-hmm. Because every time I would start to get really good and I would start to be able to push him a little bit. Because we all know Joe's credentials when it comes to amateur wrestling. You know, sure. two-time British champion, Commonwealth Games team member, you know... Uh, He's, you know, he's done a lot in terms of amateur wrestling in a short period of time. But, and again, I can give Joe a little bit of, of, of trouble when I wrestle him, you know, uh, I can score on him and stuff like that. But every time I would start to figure something out that would be good within a week or two, he'd figure out another attack or another defense for it. And it would force me to go, right, now I need to come up with something new. And it's really allowed me to create this, like a much better, uh, a much better sort of game plan for amateur wrestling, you know, and allowed me to kind of go to big national competitions like the English Open or the British Open and take, you know, take medals, you know? Yeah, absolutely, man. And obviously, you know, we've talked about Joe's credentials, but I mean, for yourself, you you know, you've got the background of, of amateur wrestling. You won the, was it the 125 kilogram weight class, wasn't it? Uh, bronze medal I did, yeah. at the British Seniors last year. So last year I, I wrestled, I, I did the English Open, uh, yeah. In the beginning of the year, I and I won at 97 kilos. Okay, and I won bron- I won bronze there, mm-hmm. uh, which was interesting. You know, at the end that was that was kind of that was my second competition, and then we then for the British Open. So I I, I trained really hard for the British Open, and I, I like for, this was when I really started to feel comfortable and more confident as an amateur wrestler, mm-hmm. and believed that I was kind of one of the better one of the best guys in the country. And I, we already, we were kind of sending a full team down. So we had guys at like all different weight classes from like, you know, 65 all the way up to, you know, 120. Oh man. So you were coming to take over. Well, Joe and I were both, we both are 97 kilo guys. Mm-hmm. But one thing we don't want to do is you don't want to wrestle your teammates, especially at the British Open, sure. because, you know, it's, it's a team effort and, you know, it just... You'd rather it's game theory, you know. I if I want to win a gold medal, I have to take it from him, and vice versa for him. He has to win if, to win a gold medal. He has to take it from me. Mm. You know, his success comes at my expense, and you know my success would come at his expense. Mm-hmm. So one of the so I weighed about one hundred and two, one hundred and three kilos at the time. Joe was probably around about 95, 96. So he would comfortably make the ninety-seven kilo weight class. Right. 
Whereas me, I'd have to cut a bit of weight for it. And I was like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to try 125 kilo class. Let's wow. see what happens. So for us, I just thought that way we've got a full team. We, you know, we didn't have anybody at 125 kilos. I was like, you know what? I'll try this. And my logic was I'll, you know, I'll, I'll kind of be able to outspeed and outcondition these bigger guys, mm -hmm. you know, uh, which for the most part was true, you know, for the most part was true. Uh, but there was a couple of guys that were just basically myself, but 20 kilos heavier. Wow. Like they were just big and strong and just athletic and, you know, I'm able to score a few points on them here and there, but it's just, it's, it's, you're asking your body, you're asking too much of your body to try and, you know, in a, in an environment where the technique, where I have more technique or I'm a better wrestler, it's not that big a deal. Mm -hmm. But when these guys are at the top of the game at 125 kilos, it's like you're, you're fighting, you're fighting a different, different kind of class of, of, of athlete, you know? Yeah. And I mean, if you're shipping uh, 23, but, 24 kilos to some of these guys, then I man, like I was, I, so I was way, I was easily by a country mile, the smallest guy in the weight class by an absolute country mile. Like these guys, I believe the guy that took silver was 117 kilos. Wow. And the guy that took gold was, the guy that took gold was all of 125 kilos. Like That's, this guy oh. was like, this guy had veins on his calves. Let's put it that way. <laughs> oh you know, this guy was absolutely jacked out of his mind. Uh, but yeah, you, you, you know, you, you get to the leg, you score a couple of points and stuff like that, but it's just not enough. Like you have to be able to impose your will. Um, but it did, it made me, but at no point did I feel uncomfortable. At no point did I feel nervous. I, I felt great. Um, and, you know, had a little bit of success because I managed to take the bronze. But yeah, so I'm, I'm a, bronze, a national bronze medalist in two different weight classes. That's amazing. Which is uh, quite funny. And, uh, and super heavyweight and heavyweight. So that's geez. quite funny. And the thing is like, doesn't that say more about your ability? You know, the fact that you were able to take bronze in two different weight classes, but also against really quite heavy odds, you know, literally heavy odds in some cases where it's, you know, guys that are outweighing you by 20 odd kilos. Um, yes. Yeah. Especially as well, when you consider that um, at the end of uh, 2018, you discovered you had that partially torn left bicep, um, which, yeah, man, you know, that that's can't an help interesting either. Thing, yeah. So you, yeah, you bring up a good point there. I so at the end of 2018, I was uh, so I wrestled in the British Open in October, and then after that, like you kind of go through this this thing. And anybody that's done any sort of athletic endeavor, uh, particularly anybody that's kind of a fighter or done wrestling in the past, uh, and I've done you know I've kind of I've done a little bit of uh, some like mixed martial arts stuff as well. Um, so, but the, anyone will tell you that when you prepare for a competition or you prepare for a fight. Like you will try and peak for the day. So you train really, really hard for like 10 weeks or so. And then you taper off like a week before the competition and you go in there, all the work that you've done in that kind of eight to 10 weeks, like you feel this, you, t you feel terrible leading up into it. And then you take that week to taper off. And then as you taper off, your body feels amazing. You get into the competition and you're like, I'm ready to go. I tapered off at like the perfect time. Mm -hmm. I felt you, you go for about five to seven days. You feel like you're king of the world. You feel that like you can destroy anything or anyone. And for about seven days, about the Wednesday before the competition, the competition was on the Saturday, about the Wednesday before that, I felt amazing. I was just piecing everybody up in training. Mm -hmm. I was destroying everyone. I, was, I felt amazing. I felt great. Go to the competition on Saturday, feeling amazing, feeling great. Feel great all the way through until the, very, the following Wednesday, and I just hit the wall. I was just like, Burp. just my whole body was just like, oh God. Like, and I just, all the 10 weeks of just kicking my own ass up and down the place, training, you know, I was training pretty much six days a week, sometimes twice a day. Like, and for me, like, that doesn't sound like a great deal when you consider there's athletes that are, that are like, I train every day, twice a day. Like, I'm a complete, you know, myself and, and Joe included, we're completely clean athletes, mm -hmm. you know? There's no, I know there's been, in certain circles, there's kind of always been like, oh, you know, this, oh, you know, that. Like, I've, you know, I've never touched any performance answers in my life, mm -hmm. you know? And neither has Joe. So for guys like us, it's like, that sort of training is insanely difficult. The recovery is, is insanely tough to do, you know? You're asking your body to do a shit pile. Mm. Uh, and you have to make sure that everything is on point, that your sleep is on point, your nutrition is on point. Because one, if one thing's slightly off, you're just, you're, you're fucked, really. Yeah, right. uh, 
And so I did that and then I just hit the wall and then I just kind of tapered off after the competition. I just sort of like, right, I'm just going to take it easy. I'm not really going to do anything too crazy. And then by about mid-November, early December, I started to kind of, you know, start training harder again. I started to be like, right, now I'm going to start getting prepared for the English Open. The English Open just happened. It was uh, just a few weeks back in February. And I was like, right, now I'm, I'm going to move back down to 97 kilos and I'm going to go and I'm going to win the English Open. That's going to be the plan. Uh, I wanted to be the English champion. So I'm, do, I'm training, I'm training. And just one day I'm training and my left arm just feels a bit rough. Like it's just not, I'd always had issues with it. Mm. It'd always been like every now and then it would start to hurt or like my arm would just be like, ah, oh, it's really sore. It'd be tough to bend or whatnot. And I always just chalked it up to my arm, just kind of a bit of repetitive strain, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then one day we're training and we're working drills. I'm working drills with this lad uh, who's an absolute beast of a wrestler. I'm going to call him out, uh, Lockie Murray. He's an absolute beast. He's only like 19 years old, but he's like super strong, super athletic, super flexible. Uh, he's hopefully going to be competing uh, at the 2022 Commonwealth Games. Uh, I think that's his goal. But yeah, shout out to him because he's an absolute beast for such a young lad. Uh, and I was working drills with him and he went for a takedown on me. And, you know, you're just in drilling. You're just, you're not really putting up resistance. You're just sort of letting guys kind of move around and practice technique. Mm -hmm. And he goes for a takedown and I just sort of land like, if you imagine like you land on your hand, but yeah. then your arm completely flexes 100%. Oh. And like, it wouldn't have been a big problem if it wasn't for the fact that, yeah, I actually had a torn bicep and I didn't oh. realize that. Mm -hmm. And I just felt this massive, like sharp sort of like destructive pain in oh. my in my arm and in my, my bicep. And it's like, imagine like, I don't know if you, anyone like listeners out there can do this just now, but imagine like taking your other arm and putting it in the crook of your elbow or putting your hand in the crook of your elbow and then flexing it as hard as possible. <clears throat> You'll get yeah. like a crushing sensation in your bicep. It's like almost like your bicep's being crushed. Uh, and uh, that's kind of what it was. And I was like, I still, then I, you know, I got back up and I still sort of wrestled a little bit. And it wasn't until after that I was like, oh no, I can't move my arm. I was like, like I couldn't lift my arm to touch my own face. That's insane. Like, do you know what I mean? Like I couldn't do, I couldn't do any of that. And I was like, oh God. So like driving home was an absolute nightmare. Uh, cause I couldn't use the handbrake cause I couldn't reach my arm back saying, like, to use the handbrake. <laughs> so I'm like doing hill starts, like <laughs> using the clutch and the brake. And I'm just like, huh, huh, like trying to balance the clutch out. That's ridiculous. Uh, and then I was like, okay, I'll give this a day and I'll see how it goes. And I gave it a day and it didn't feel any better. I was like, oh no, this is like almost worse. So I just went to A&E, was sitting there for like two, three hours oh, waiting. Man. I get in and they're like, oh yeah, you've had a very partially torn bicep for a long time. And I was like, yeah. They're like, yeah, it's, it's, not an emul uh, it's not an emulsion or an avulsion, sorry, which is basically like a complete tear off the bone. Mm -hmm. uh, that's usually at the tendon uh, where they'd have to, where the bicep would t typically roll up the arm or whatnot, like you've seen. Mm. Uh, if you look at like, I can't remember which arm it is, but if you look at like Rey Mysterio's right arm, I think it is. Yeah. If yeah. you look at his bicep, it's kind of far, quite high up his arm. Mm -hmm. It's just, from a, that's from a torn bicep. Uh, and that's typically what happens when it's an avulsion and it snaps at the tendon. Uh, this one, they were saying, oh no, it's kind of a partial tear in the middle of the bicep. Oh God. And there's like, so they were like, there's really not much we can do about it. Like you just kind of have to wait it out and heal it. And I was like, you're kidding, right? And they're like, no, there's really not much we can do. And I was like, for God's sake. And I was like, okay. And right, so, at, the, right at the peak of your powers as well. Like, you know, you... Well, oh. yeah, I was kind of like, I, I was like, well, that's, I guess that, I mean, I'll see how it goes. But, one of the things I drew confidence from uh, for the British Open was the preparation. You know, I, I'm a big believer in everybody says, you know, and there's a, people say that things are like 90% mental, 10% mm -hmm. physical. I'm kind of the other way. I'm a big believer that you can, things will be achieved if the physical prep is done. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't matter how you feel. Because I've had situations like my driving test was an example mm -hmm. where I didn't feel confident going into my uh, the, the the test at all, like the the theory test. I I was like, oh, watch me be the guy that goes in and fails by like one mark or some shit. <laughs> I was like, watch me be that guy. But because I had done the physical preparation and the revision and the studying, I went in there and I was like, oh, I know all this. I've seen these questions before. And the British Open felt like that. Like when I stepped on the mat, I didn't feel overwhelmed at all. Like I'd I you know if little tiny things like. 
put, wearing your singlet in training is a mm. big deal for me because it, it's like, this is the uniform I'm going to don on a day. This is going to be the battle uniform that's going to be, I'm going to be wearing when I compete, you know? Uh, just those, those scenarios. And the physical prep is what helped me. And I thought, right, if, if this heals quite quick, I'm still going to have enough time to get maybe six, five, six weeks of prep in for the Ringish Open. And at least that way I can do the drills, I can do the cardio, I can do the strength work, and I can still be physically prepared. Well, six weeks go by, and I'm not using my arm at all. I did no weightlifting. I did, I did really basically nothing. I was away from wrestling for a while. Uh, again, that's why I haven't really been doing much pro wrestling stuff the last kind of while, because I've been waiting on this bicep to heal. I was going to say, because it's like, uh, what was it, November was your last match, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, and I've I've kind of just been just taking some time away to kind of I took some time away just because I kind of there was that and then there was some family issues as well. Okay. Uh, we we don't need to I won't, go into that at all. I won't go into much detail, no. but like my dad got pretty sick uh, April of last year. Actually, mm. he got pretty sick. And he's still kind of sick to this day. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. Again, man, I won't go into it. Yeah, uh, it is what it is, you know. And I didn't really absorb it at the time. You know what I mean? I kind of took it on the chin and was like, oh, I'll just, you know, this is what I have to do. This is, this is now the situation. This is now the scenario. Mm -hmm. And I never really let myself absorb it. I never let myself sort of go, oh, this is, yeah, this is not good. I never let myself sort of take a second to absorb it. I just sort of moved forward. And, you know, I was kind of started running, you know, all the things that he did kind of around my, you know, my parents' home, I yeah. started sort of doing, you know, making sure that the rent was paid on time, making sure that everything was kind of like the, the bills were paid on time, you know, making sure that everything was kind of running. And I just did that. And I did that for a long time. And it wasn't until the, that injury that I sort of sat down and went, yeah, I'm fucked. Like I've, yeah. I've not taken a second to really look, you know, I can't even see the forest for the trees, you know, I yeah. need to, take myself away and just n no pro wrestling, no amateur wrestling, no MMA, nothing, no, nothing, no, no weightlifting, no training, just focus on other things. And that's where I kind of got really delved into the stuff with Joe with like uh, the podcast and the, the kind of filming of, uh, you know, uh, free agent stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah. I, you're right. I, the, the injury was bad. It's starting to come around now. It's starting to come around now. It's probably at about 80, 90% now. Okay. Like, I'm confident that I could, I can work pro wrestling matches with it, but like, and then I can, I'm wrestling again, you know, I'm wrestling pretty hard again. Uh, I'm still not back to striking stuff yet. Like I'm not doing any sort of kickboxing or Muay Thai stuff yet, mm -hmm. but, uh, or submission stuff just in case somebody tries to like put in an arm bar or something. Yeah, of course. But, yeah. uh, I'm almost, I'm almost back to a hundred percent. So you've been doing quite a bit of MMA training, haven't you? You mentioned there the Muay Thai and, uh, kickboxing and how, how have you been finding that? Like, is the transition from amateur and pro wrestling to MMA quite significant or, you know, how does that yeah. balance occur? Uh, I had the same, I had the same uh, come to Jesus meeting with myself <laughs> when I first did MMA uh, and I first did amateur wrestling uh, that I had when I first tried pro wrestling where I thought I was in shape and I thought I was like athletic and then I yeah. did amateur wrestling and I was like, oh shit, like I have no cardio. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> uh, I was, I'll tell you what, I, I defy anybody to find a tougher sport than a freestyle wrestling. Really? It's one of the toughest sports on the planet. Wow. I'm honestly, I, I mean, there probably is tougher sports. Like I'm sure like uh, hurling or something <laughs> is like tougher or something like that. Or, you know, but like, where you're getting like smacked in the shins with like giant, massive hockey Oof. sticks and stuff. But yeah, like, right. honestly, I believe that amateur wrestling is one of the most physically and mentally tough sports ever. It, it teaches you a lot about who you are as a person. I've had a few moments, like there's nothing quite like, you're, you've got a minute left and you're down two points and you shoot on a guy and you're underneath him. He sprawls on you underneath him and you've got a choice to make. You've got mm -hmm. a choice to make. Either you sit there and he beats you or you keep going, even though you've got nothing left, you keep driving through him and you take him down and you get your two points and win. You know, you, you come to those moments where you're like, you know, you learn about yourself. Oh, that's but crazy. MMA, I did MMA first, actually. I did MMA before amateur wrestling. All right, okay. Um, so... The club I was at, like I was at an MMA gym and, you know, they did amateur wrestling stuff, but it was kind of like rough around the edges. Like they didn't really have a proper wrestling coach and kind of, you know, it was what it was. They were just kind of like doing their thing. Uh, it was, it was okay to learn, you know, it was good to learn the techniques and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And I was doing MMA stuff. And again, just learning to strike and learning to kind of use my legs to kick and stuff like that, like work on my flexibility so I can like do head kicks and stuff like that, uh, which I couldn't do at the beginning. 
uh, you know, using my knees and stuff like again, you'll have seen one or two things sort of be implemented into my style mm. in pro wrestling. Like mm-hmm. I've implemented one or two things, not a great deal of things. Uh, I've used like a couple of, like uh, boxing type punches occasionally, and like I'll use kicks and stuff. Like when I worked, I think I worked Matt Riddle, uh, mm. who's now again doing also doing very well for himself in NXT. Right. Uh, Matt Riddle, I got a chance to work with Matt Riddle in Discovery Wrestling, uh, not last year but the year before, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I got a chance to work with him, and I used a lot of my uh, my amateur stuff and. Uh, a lot of my MMA stuff there, like a lot of the grappling and a lot of that stuff uh, with him. Because again, obviously he was probably one of the most qualified, legit shooters in the pro wrestling industry, you know? Sure. Uh, and I got a re- I really got a chance to sort of delve into that stuff with him. Mm. Um, but yeah, like I, I've been, do- been doing that stuff. It's really fun, man. Like it's really, really fun. It's really allowed me to work on footwork, flexibility, cardio. Uh, it's helped my pro wrestling quite a bit. I was say, like, I mean, all the techniques, and you can see it in your style, you know, with the matches I've watched of, of yours, um, all those elements there, it, it, it just solidifies you as a talent, you know, and I have to say that because it's, it's true. You know, it's not me blowing smoke up your ass or anything like that. It's legit. You are a fantastic wrestler, and I, I'm looking forward to when you're, your arm's fully 100% and you get back in the ring, man. Um, I appreciate that, man. That's no problem at all to say it, you know. Um, and obviously last year... Um, you had your debut with ICW and you stated to me off air, um, there was something you wanted to get off your chest regarding uh, Bantz and ICW. Yeah, man. It's, it's really interesting. Like I, again, the Bantz character was sort of, it was, it was probably one of the, it was one of the best ideas on paper. Mm-hmm. It really was. Uh, it was kind of, it, it was really, really great on paper and it, it kind of, it wasn't actually my debut. It was kind of like a re-debut because yeah. I'd worked in ICW previously. I was going to say, like when I was looking through your match stats, there was some stuff from like 2015, I think, and, and before. Yeah, I worked in ICW previously as part of the Gate Crashers as a ah, tag team of course. with yeah. uh, Chris Saint, uh, which, you know, and I'll, I'll just state this for now. Like, I honestly believe that that tag team was, we could have been the best in, in, in the country. I mm-hmm. honestly think that we could have been the best tag team in the country. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't work out that way. Kind of, he had other ideas. Mm. Um, you know, shit happens. But, uh, so yeah, I worked at ICW previously, you know, and I was kind of unceremoniously just kind of, you know, things didn't really work out. So I kind of, Joe kind of was like, hey, we have this idea. Uh, you know, we, we were kind of, Bantz kind of came around when we were, we were out one night. We're all, it was me, him, I think, uh, Joe's brother and his cousin. And we're all just sort of chilling and we're all having a laugh and whatnot. And we're talking and uh, and I end up coming out with something. I can't remember what it was. I was like, I said, I said something along the lines of like, oh, when it comes to women, I'm all about the band today. Something like that. <laughs> or I'm all about the bands. And they're just like, holy shit, that's funny as hell. And Joe comes to me like a week or two later and he goes, Dave, what do you think about this idea of this character called Bands? And I'm like, Okay. And he goes, <laughs> he's basically just, he's, he's basically, we're going to build him up as like this guy loaded with charisma. He's like an expert at everything. He's like super phil- philosophical and like really intelligent. But whenever he talks, he just says like two things or he just says like one thing, just like, not it. And I thought, <laughs> okay, that's actually a hilarious idea. And we, we built it up. The idea was because so. And again, this is just, again, I don't know if this is the general perception, but this is mm. kind of the perception I see is that in pro wrestling, I'm a very, I'm a good worker. I've got yeah. a good physique, but Dave Conrad can't talk. Dave Conrad doesn't have a personality. He doesn't have any character. He can't talk. That was kind of the, the perception, you know? And in pro wrestling, unfortunately, perception is reality. Yeah. Uh, so we thought, well, this could be a hilarious, uh, this could be a hilarious way of kind of like an in-joke on the fans. Kind of like, oh, Dave can't talk okay, then he'll say one thing. And that was, kind of the, that was kind of the funny story of it, you know? And we had so many scenarios that we were going to do, like hilarious things that we were going to do where it's like Dave will just show him. And eventually over time, so the idea was it was going to start the way it started. Like, you, you know, you'll have seen an ICW where it's like, we build up that like, oh, he's so charismatic. He's the most charismatic individual on earth. And then I just go, all right. And everyone's like, <laughs> what the fuck? Uh, the problem was, live audiences didn't get it yeah they were kind of waiting on something else and uh they were kind of waiting on something bigger or they kind of wanted to you know pro wrestling fans to this day you know unfortunately a lot of the fans 
you know, and this is a, it, meh, this is kind of a small minority. The mm. vast majority of fans, to me, have always been, oh, they, they you know, they want to be, they want to enjoy the show. They're there mm. to kind of enjoy what's there. But there's a small pocket of fans, particularly in places like, you know, the big kind of indie places like ICW, Progress, stuff like that, mm-hmm. where the fans, there's a small pocket of fans that want to take over the show for themselves, uh, mm-hmm. get themselves over. And that's what they sort of started doing with this Banch character. Oh, uh, no. Uh, you know, the idea was supposed to be a big reveal and it just didn't happen. The problem was, all it did really was it just sort of, it sort of perpetuated those perceptions mm. where it sort of allowed fans to go, oh, they didn't, th- they didn't realize that the gimmick, there was a, an in-joke. Yeah. They thought that it was, oh, Dave's not saying anything because Dave can't. That's yeah. what I believe it was. And I think that's what fans saw it as. Like the idea was that we were eventually going to branch it off and kind of branch it off into sort of what you see now on Free Agent, yes, where yeah. he's kind of this weird. He's got he's very philosophical mm. or he's very sort of like deep, but he's also just got like a rage temper where he got can it. just lose his temper at times. And that was going to be eventually what it was going to uh, build to. Like eventually we're going to build it to like segments where like everyone's just kind of chatting about what they did at the weekend and then Bantz will just come out and just be like oh well I visited the National Museum of Scotland you know and was really appreciating the the fine artwork and brushwork of you know the latest works in there and then everyone just turn around and go the fuck yeah right like where did that come from you know what I mean like and it would almost be this weird thing where like they would like go into his house and he's just got like a million trophies for like rage things like the, like the ten pin bowling Scottish Championship or whatever, and they're just like, when did when did you win that, Dave? <laughs> just like stuff like that, or like, what did you do the weekend, Dave? Oh, I just you know, caught all one hundred fifty one oh. Pokemon. See, that'd be nuts. You know, Espe- like, especially if he had like amnesia, so he doesn't actually have a clue I, that he's done any of it. But like, just like funny yeah, stuff. Like we had so many amazing. ideas for segments. But she has such a cool character, man. And yeah, and it was going to branch oh. off to that. But what happened was, so this is kind of what happened. So we ended up having a. Uh, a match and I'm not going to go into deep detail I'm not going to name sure. any names but okay. we ended up having a match and it was kind of you know the, the the kind of the re-debut of, uh, of myself there and the match didn't quite go too great mm-hmm. uh, it didn't go great it was kind of it was all kind of messed up and things just didn't quite go to plan and you know that happens you have those nights you know you have those nights where things don't go to plan you know um, you know I felt okay I you know I did everything I needed to do uh, but we ended up uh, I got I got backstage, everything was kind of sound as uh, sound and everything was okay. Mm-hmm. But then I'd heard, I just never, I never got any correspondence back. Okay. You know, and I will say this throughout all of this, this whole process of ICW last year, mm. because of what had been going on with uh, my dad and kind of, my, and all that stuff, I was kind of not, I wouldn't say I was checked out, but I was definitely not, I enjoyed the band stuff. I enjoyed mm. that because I could dig my, my teeth into it and I was working with Joe and stuff. So I was like, right, I, could, I can dig my teeth into this, you know? And I liked uh, Leighton that we're working with. You know, he was, Leighton was, he, he's honestly a really, really good young talent. You know, uh, Leighton Buzzard, I think he's going to be, I think he's going to be really good mm-hmm. uh, once he gets a bit more experience behind him. Like he's, he, he's really, really keen. He's really, he's, he's a super nice, uh, really athletic lad. I think he's going to do quite well. Uh, really gets he gets it you know he gets yeah. the humor he gets the he gets the sort of being able to kind of poke fun at himself as a character you know um so working with him and joe was obviously like great fun and we were having a blast with it like we were having a laugh but i just i wasn't really pursuing other things with wrestling i was just sort of like seeing what came my way That's and uh yeah and um so and, and so i had no correspondence with icw throughout that entire thing ICW never spoke to me once. Wow. Uh, they never messaged me. They never gave me any dates. I, everything I got, I got through Joe. I got, I got told where to be, when to be there uh, through Joe. And then they were doing a gimmick at the, I believe it was Shug's Hoose Party last year. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, it was going to be Joe versus uh, Renfrew in a street fight, I mm-hmm. believe it was. Or it was like a Glasgow street fight or something. Okay. And the idea was it was going to be Joe by himself. Uh, doing this he was like, i'm gonna do this by myself in a, in, a, in a gimmick that was the idea uh from a character standpoint uh and uh, so obviously i wasn't going to be there um and then but i think leighton did show up at one point and wow. then after that i kind of went ah yeah, yeah that's kind of yep that's <laughs> and they've never community. they've never spoken to me about it since like they've never spoken to me about it since they've never uh 
they've never I've never had any word from them. Uh, you know, things kind of went awry in that match, and unfortunately, I don't think anyone ever asked my side. You know, yeah. no one ever asked my side of it. Uh, no one ever asked my opinion on it. I just sort of, you know, unceremoniously kind of cut, and it was just like, there you go. Wow. See you. And I was like, oh. Well, that's just terrific, you know. Yeah. I mean, at least uh, at least WCW, uh, you know, Eric Bischoff sent out a fucking FedEx, you know. <laughs> I know, yeah, I know. I mean, it is what it is, man. Like, I'm not really too. I was a bit pissed off about it at the time, like just because I didn't, you know, I don't mind if if that's the case. Mm. If that's the case, it's like I don't mind. But let me get my side of the story out, you know. I mean, let me let me explain my side of it. Let me let me defend myself a little bit, rather than someone, you know, my 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 thoughts are that someone's mentioned something to someone right. and, you know, as the kind of, unfortunately, as the sort of quote unquote new guy in town, so to speak, I've kind of taken the brunt end of it. Yeah. Despite the fact that kind of, you know, I, I did everything I could in that match to do, to, you know, what yeah, exactly. do, you know, I think it sounds, but it is what it yeah. is, you know, I'm not really that, I'm not really that fussed about it, but I just think it's important that I clear the air with that because I think it's, Unfortunately, in indie wrestling, especially here, what tends to happen at the bigger companies tends to trickle down to the smaller companies. Right. And people tend to look at the bigger companies as, well, why is that guy not there? Or how come he was there, but now he's not there? What happened there? Exactly. And instead of, instead of checking out these things or, or speaking to someone and finding out what happened, they tend to just kind of go off of what the, you know, the perception. As yeah. I said, perception is reality, unfortunately. So the perception was Dave can't talk. Uh, uh, and apparently he's not good enough in matches either because he got cut from ICW on ceremoniously after one match. Whereas it's, it could not be more different. It could exactly. not be more opposite to what happened. And that's, that's the thing. And anyone that's seen your work knows how much passion and even listen to the, you know, this when people listen to this back, they're going to hear how much passion you've got for the industry. And, you know, obviously that now comes across in free agent, which, uh, you know, launched on March the 1st and has been running now for a little while. Um, I yeah. personally think it's absolutely bloody brilliant. Um, I've been thank watching you, it. Thank I, you. Oh, mate. Honestly, I've not laughed so genuinely hard in my life. As there's just moments in that show where you come off hilariously. And Joe even said when we spoke to him a couple of weeks back. Um, obviously, the show is yourself, Joe, and his brother Jabakus or Jake. Um, yeah. Jo- Joe actually alluded to this on the podcast. He said that fans consider you to be one of the funniest parts of of your podcast, and certainly of a free agent. Um, and that definitely comes through, but do you find like, obviously, you know, Joe's your best friend and, and we've, you know, you've put him over a great amount in this, in this podcast today. Um, how, how do I phrase this? Cause obviously it's difficult knowing how close you are to Joe. And obviously that's, that's come through in free agent as well. But I mean, do you feel he holds you back at all? Like, are you in his shadow or, how, you know, how do you feel about, about working with somebody who whoa, comes whoa, off? Whoa, so? Whoa, wait, wait, wait a minute there, uh, Rich, you, you can't be saying that about Joe. Well, like he's, he's my friend. Well, yeah, I, I, I'm not denying he's your friend. I just, well, no, no, you, no, hold on. You're, are you trying to, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to make me talk bad about Joe? No, I, I never, I just, um, uh, um, Rich, I mean, it, you saw the show, yeah. right? I mean, you've seen the things I've done to, for, 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 for Joe in the past, you know, he, I would, mm-hmm. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be remiss as to do that, to do that again, Rich. Like you can't, Joe, Joe's my friend. He's the things he's done for me are insane. The things he's done for, for, for people in general are insane. I mean, for you to insinuate that Joe would ever hold me back or ever do anything like that to, 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 to harm me Dave, or, or to, 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 um, what, what are you doing? Um, like, please, you know, it's, it's, I, I, I would. No, 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 no. You, you don't understand this, Rich. You, you can't talk bad about Joe. I'm going to, I'm going to come over. Hold on. You, you can't talk bad about Joe like that. I'm not going to sit here and allow you to insult my best friend like that in front of my face. Are you, are you serious? You bring me on your show and you want to do an interview with me. And then you decide you want to try and, 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 and you want to try and insult Joe to my face. I mean, how much gumption do you have? Um, why, 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 why are you putting your hands there on my shoulders? Why um, they're getting towards my neck, uh, Dave? Dave, <coughs> Dave. <coughs> it's fine. It's fine. It's fine, Rich. It's fine. Just, 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 just stay quiet. Rich. Just, 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 just stay quiet. You cannot insult Joe like that. Okay. 
He has done so much for me and others. All right? Okay, I'm going to let you go now. Okay? Hopefully. Okay, there you go. There you go. Hopefully. Hopefully you understand now that you can't be talking like that. Okay? Okay. To answer your question, no. I do not believe Joe has held me back. He has done so many things for me, for Jake. Jake himself has done so much for me. I am, I am enjoying, I am enjoying what's happening. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so we like to end these, <coughs> excuse me, uh, these podcasts. Oh my God. Just sip some water. <clears throat> on a, on a positive. <clears throat> There you go. Drink, drink yeah. that down. Drink that down. Thank you for for. Edu- you're gonna be okay. Yeah. You're, you're gonna be okay. Thank, just, thank, thank you for. Edu- I, I'm sorry, edu- man. No, I, I'm no, sorry. No. I lost. I lost myself a little bit there. No. You, you just Fine. when I, you. I was when you talk bad about Joe like that. I just my, my mind just goes into another another mm. another place. You know, you can't. You, you, I'm. I, I do apologize. No, no, I'm sorry. Please. It's it's me. That you should was, apologize. That's that's too <coughs> too much. Um. Let me rephrase. Free agent, <coughs> excuse me. Free agent <coughs> is a, a massive success, um, and we like to end the podcast on a on a positive. Is there anybody um, that you'd like to put over that doesn't <coughs> normally get a shout out? Um, in terms of free agent, I would like to put over. I'd actually like to put over uh, uh, Joe's girlfriend, Sophie. Okay, <clears throat> she's, done, she's done a lot of uh, she's done a lot of work uh, behind the scenes. People didn't see. She's doing a lot of work behind the scenes with uh, not just with free agent, but also with the Patreon and stuff that people uh, don't get to see. Um, but she, she, yeah, so she's doing a lot of work there. That you know, as I say, it's not on camera, so to speak, so people don't understand it. Um, but I just want to put over everybody on that show. Joe, Joe's ideas are brilliant. Uh, Jake, he, again, he's another one whose ideas are fantastic. His perspective on things is great because sometimes being an outside, being outside of pro wrestling allows, allows him to look at things in a different perspective. Um, so that's, you know, I, I'm just, to be honest with you, I'm just really thankful to be part of the show because it's, it's going to finally allow me to showcase what I can do, you know, showcase to audiences that, yeah, Dave can talk, and yeah, Dave does have a personality. You know, a lot of that stuff is improv. You know, we don't sit and 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 write a script out or whatnot for free agent. It's it's a lot of his improv. Like you'll have seen from you know anyone that's got the Patreon. You know, uh, subscribe to the Patreon. I think it's uh, it's patreoncom Henry. If you join the Patreon, you'll find like bloopers and stuff and outtakes and stuff from uh, parts of it, which are brilliant. Like we end up bursting out laughing half the time because the ideas are just so ridiculous and off the wall. But uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'd put I'd put over just everybody behind the scenes that's that's working on it. Um, Joe as well. Joe doesn't get enough credit for exactly how much work he's doing behind the scenes and that. Like he's on the show and they see kind of what's out there. But you know he's editing it together and he's adding in music and stuff like like I just I just show up and and put my ideas forward and then and and then do what needs to be done yeah. you know uh <clears throat> joe, he's joe, the one that's really the mastermind behind everything joe really is fantastic i and yes and I, I fully understand that now um how just how great he is um and and all well, of you guys and yeah I'm, i feel i feel more educated having spoken to you <coughs> spoken to you today um so I just got to say thank you for for your time. Uh, thank you for coming on the, the the show. Thank you very much for having me. Honestly, this has been a blast. Yes, yeah, definitely. Um, it's been an experience um, for myself as well. Uh, I feel we got very close today and had a good conversation. <coughs> I, I, I think uh, I think closeness is good. Mm. I think closeness. So um, yeah, just re- <coughs> just remains to say uh, thank you for listening. Um, obviously on YouTube now, also on SoundCloud. Um, if you'd like to subscribe, please do so. Uh, ring the bell to be notified of anywhere, um, any time that we, <coughs> excuse me, upload. Um, where can where can we find you on, on socials, Dave? 
So if you're looking for me, I am the Dave Conrad on Twitter. Give me a follow. Uh, I am Dave Conrad official on Facebook and Instagram. Um, check out free agent on uh, youtube.com slash Joe Hendry free agent. The first episode is up. Join the Patreon to immediately get access to episode two, as well as bloopers of the show and many, many other benefits. We have multiple tiers. There's plenty of content out there for anyone who's a fan or anyone that wants to support us and support the show. And that's at patreon.com slash Joe Hendry. Um, yeah, any of that stuff, subscribe to the YouTube, join the Patreon, follow me on the social media, um, and we'll keep you updated with what's going on. You know, not only with that, but for me, like, update on my pro wrestling stuff. I've got some things in the works. I've got some things in the works. I've been kind of sitting on my hands for a little bit, but I've got some things in the works coming up and I'm, I'm excited for the prospects that 2019 is going to bring. Uh, so if you want to be a part of that and you want to keep along with it, follow me on social media. That's the Dave Carnard on Twitter and Dave Carnard official on Facebook and Instagram. Yeah, definitely do that. And, uh, you know, show Dave a lot of love. Um, and Joe and, and the gang and uh, as I say obviously thank you for listening to the podcast today thank you Dave for joining us thanks so much for having me man no worries man uh, always a pleasure and um, yeah subscribe ring the bell for notifications when we upload head over to smacktalk.co.uk to pick up merch from our store uh, anything you buy helps us provide new and diverse content by supporting the show and yeah we'll see you on the next one <laughs>